Okay, we're back. We're live. We're Think Tech. And uh, I guess you could say this is a Hanukkah. The reason I know that is it's 2 o'clock on a Monday. That's why I know that. It's a Hanukkah. Uh, but it's Community Matters also, and it's entitled Proud to be Hawaiian and American. And it stars Kali'i Akina, who is the CEO of Grassroot Institute and otherwise the host of a Hanukkah. Co. But today, special... Uh, we're doing a, 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 an alternation, if you will, and I'm going to be the host. I'm Jay Fidel, and Kali'i is going to be my guest, and I always like to do that. So, Kali'i, welcome to your show. Well, thank you, Jay. <laughs> Aloha to you. Great to be with you and all the wonderful viewers of Ehanakako. So, things are happening for you. I mean, aside from being the CEO of Grassroot uh, Institute and being the uh, host, the talk show host of Ehanakako here on ThinkTech, you are also, it appears now, recently in the press running for office. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, I am a candidate for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs position, trustee at large, which is a statewide race in which everyone can vote. So I get to wear a couple of hats. Uh, my day job is as president of the Grassroot Institute, which is Hawaii's premier uh, think tank that deals with individual liberty and free markets and limited government. But I'm also somebody throwing my hat into the rink uh, to be part of finding solutions here in our state for a better future. Why are you running? I'm running because I care about Hawaii. I care about my own people, Native Hawaiians, and all people here. And I want to run to preserve the aloha spirit. Uh, I think that one of the most important things about these islands is the fact that we love each other, we include each other. Uh, it's one of those places where we could realize the dream of Martin Luther King that people are judged by the content of their heart, not the color of their skin. And there's a lot of attack upon the Aloha spirit. So that's one reason that I'm running. It's for the unity of all people. A second reason I'm running is because this agency called the Office of Hawaiian Affairs needs to be held accountable to fulfill its mission of serving Hawaiians and all the people of Hawaii. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that probably, Jay, uh, as uh, you ask me more questions. <laughs> yes, well, I do. And I, I'd like to know your essential you know, approach to OHA, uh, what you would do, for example, if elected, when elected, uh, as a trustee. Well, my whole approach stems from my love of the United States of America and of being Hawaiian. And I, I see no contradiction. I'm proud to be Hawaiian and American. And I think I want to stand against all of the efforts to divide the two. So I'm on record as being opposed to OHA's plan to start a separate race-based nation. I feel that that would be divisive, that would pull people apart, and it would also harm the Hawaiian people. Uh, the millions of dollars that have been spent to date in pursuit of a separate sovereign nation of Native Hawaiians has been a complete waste, and that money instead could have been spent on helping Hawaiians and all people have better housing, better education, better uh, opportunity to be successful uh, here in Hawaii and across the world. So really, I think that we can actually do something good for Hawaii in going into the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and making a, a difference. So, uh, yeah, certainly the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has gone a long way since 1978 when it was established by the Constitutional Convention that year. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, what role do you see for it properly going forward? Well, as you mentioned, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was started in 1978 at a state constitutional convention. And the purpose of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs goes back a little bit before that. We have to keep two things in mind. First of all, as its name implies, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs as a state agency looks to make sure that the needs of Native Hawaiians are met. But it's absolutely important to understand that there's a philosophy for how those needs should be met. And that's in our Statehood Act of 1959. The Statehood Act of 1959 speaks of the ceded lands, lands held from the Kingdom of Hawaii in trust by the federal government during the territorial years. And some revenues from those lands are used by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to meet the needs of Hawaiian people. But it's so crucial to realize that the philosophy was we wouldn't divide up people in our state by race, and we wouldn't divide up the ceded lands and its money and segregate and meet needs only on a race basis. Instead, the Statehood Act of 1959 says explicitly that these lands shall be used for education for all, uh, land management for all, 
utilities for all, farming for all, and to meet the needs of the Native Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. Now in the context then of meeting the needs of everyone, we can meet the needs of Hawaiians. And so I think it's important to realize that the way people are advanced is by unity. I'll give you one example, then back to you, Jay. Take education. Uh, a, a plan to educate Hawaiians by simply identifying people who are Hawaiians and starting state-sponsored Hawaiian schools would fail miserably. But a plan that used monies from the ceded lands to improve our education system statewide, especially in populations like Nanakuli, where there are a lot of Hawaiians and all over, means that by raising the water level of one boat, we raise the water level of all. So where OHA has gotten lost is in thinking that the solution to helping Hawaiians is to segregate them from others through a sovereign nation and exclusively use the ceded lands revenues for them. The solution is the Aloha spirit. We take care of everybody all across the state, and by doing that, we take care of the Hawaiians. Lee, to put it in perspective, um, you know, where uh, Kamehameha Schools has uh, an endowment of something north of $10 billion, uh, how much, how, what, is the, what is the resource, what is the, um, you know, the assets of, uh, of OHA? Well, actually, comparing the Kamehameha schools with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is like comparing apples and oranges. That was my next yeah. question. The fundamental difference between the two is that the Kamehameha schools is a private trust. It's like when you or I uh, leave to our children uh, our estate, it's private property and it's managed by our trustees in order to meet the, the will that, that we left for it. That's exactly what happened with Princess Bernice Pawahi Bishop and Charles Reed Bishop who in their private capacities said our estate is going to go to the children of Hawaii. Now, OHA on the other hand is a very different entity. OHA is a state agency. It's set up by the people to carry out the will of the people of the state of Hawaii. And that's why everyone can vote for OHA trustees. That's why anyone can run for OHA trustees. It's to see that those revenues from the ceded lands are managed well. And one of the aims of those uh, of the ceded lands is to take care of native Hawaiians. Now you asked about the relative size. Well, it depends upon actual and potential. Actually, Kamehameha Schools, as you say, is about nine to ten billion dollars in terms of private trust. The Department of, uh, or the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, on the other hand, has somewhere between $600,000 and $800,000 in assets, but it has great potential because it's acquired 31 acres of land in Kaka'ako waterfront, which could be a billion or more uh, in terms of its potential value. And the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and I don't think that this is a totally appropriate, is seeking to lay claim to a portion of the 1.8 million acres of ceded lands that are here in Hawaii. And if they get a hold of some of that or all of that, that could be huge wealth. What about the income? Don't, doesn't uh, OHA get regular income from the state? Yes. Uh, OHA is the recipient of some of the revenues from the ceded lands that, that come from the various usages. For example, ceded lands are used for the airport. So revenues that go to the state through that uh, go to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to some extent. Ceded lands were used to build the university, uh, educational institutions, and so forth. So there are revenues that are, are assigned to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to carry out its duty, most definitely. In fact, the recent settlement uh, of the Kaka'ako waterfront land uh, is a settlement to take care of the fact that for many years the state fell behind. It was in arrears in terms of paying those rents. And there's one other organization that uh, comes to mind, and that is Homelands. Uh, how, do you, how would you compare Homelands with uh, Kamehameha Schools and uh, with OHA? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, these are three different entities. Kamehameha Schools, formerly the Bishop Estate, is a private trust. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs, on the other hand, is government. 
and so is the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. That's government. But they're not the same government agency, and they're not dealing with the same land. And, and that's very important to understand. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands has existed really in some form since the territorial years. And its mission primarily has to do with homesteading. Its appropriate mission is to help Hawaiians be able to stake their claim on a piece of homestead land. And the relationship between OHA and Department of Hawaiian Homelands is often confused because we think it's the same thing very often, but it's very different. But there is a role for OHA with regard to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Uh, many of our viewers will know that in the past 12 months, much corruption and mismanagement have been exposed at the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. There are Hawaiians who have been standing in line for decades without getting homes, while individuals with political connections have been able to get land. In addition to that, the management has been brought under scrutiny because of a lot of practices that are really inappropriate and in some cases possibly illegal. OHA cannot stand on the side and say, oh, that's not us. OHA should have been functioning as the chief advocate for the benefit of the Hawaiian people and in that role should have taken an intervening uh, capacity should have held the Department of Hawaiian Homelands accountable and through the years there have been many of the same players involved in both organizations so that's the nature of those three different organizations mm -hmm. you know it seems to me we're on a continuum as you know you mentioned earlier back in 1978 at the Constitutional Convention OHA was created and since then we've seen a lot of changes in the way the Hawaiian people the active Hawaiian people have come together. We've seen the demands they've made, the actions they've taken, the organizations that they have advanced and so forth. Uh, and I wonder if you'd uh, care to suggest where we are on the continuum. We started out in one place, say in uh, 1978, but we, we seem to be in a different place now and, and the direction seems to be different. But so where are we? Seems to me uh, your point about aloha and, uh, if you will, the decline of aloha is relevant to this. Well, I, I think we have to ask the question, how well has the Office of Hawaiian Affairs fulfilled its mission? How well has it advanced the Hawaiian people in the context of harmony with all people? How well has it managed its portion of revenues from the ceded lands, its assets, its land, and its finances, toward the goal of seeing that Hawaiians had better homes, better education, better economic opportunity, and how well has it done that within the community uh, in the sense of generating aloha for everyone. And I think there's a lot that has been lacking. Uh, for, for one thing, OHA has failed to represent the will of the people of the state of Hawaii. As a government agency, it is accountable to the people, but its major program going forward now is the establishment of a state-sponsored sovereign nation. Originally this was promoted by the Akaka Bill which sought federal recognition of Hawaiians uh, with whom the federal government would have a government-to-government -government relationship. OHA spent millions of dollars on that and then most recently OHA has been pursuing this through the native Hawaiian role called Kana'iolu Valu. Now here's the problem Millions have been spent, and up to this date, which is the beginning of May in 2014, at least $6 million have been spent uh, on this program. The problem, as one of the sitting trustees of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs said on this very program, is that it has been a complete waste of money, money that should have been spent on the beneficiaries, on housing, education, economic development, jobs, and so forth. Secondly, uh, it has uh, put OHA into a position of excluding most Hawaiians. Do you realize that in their campaign to enroll Hawaiians in this sovereign nation, the vast majority have refused to take part, of it, part in it, and the numbers that they speak of now are only there because they've dumped another list that had nothing to do with it into the numbers? As a result, OHA is failing to represent more than 75% of all Native Hawaiians and 100% of all people in the state of Hawaii. And so I think they've failed in their first mission as a government agency to represent the will of the people. I'm just going to summarize the next one because you, you may need to go to a break and I've been talking a long time. The second problem is they've failed in using the monies to build 
the kind of life for their beneficiaries that they need, need to build. And I'll add a third one. OHA is failing in the management of its assets, and I know a little bit later on, Jay, you want to talk a little bit about their Kaka'ako development plan, and uh, that's a good microcosm of showing how OHA is handling its asset base. Thank you, Kali. We're going to take a short break. That's Kali Akina. He's uh, the CEO of the Grassroot Institute. He's also host of Ehana Kako here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, today we're talking about um, community matters, and we're talking about being proud to be Hawaiian and American. And we're going to tackle that question when we come back and then go on to a myriad of other issues that are related. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host, together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. For okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on ThinkTech on a Monday afternoon. Let's call this a Hanukkah Ko, which is a Monday 2 o'clock show here on ThinkTech. We're talking about proud to be Hawaiian and American with Kali'i Akina, who is both. <laughs> He's the CEO of Grassroot Institute, and he is uh, our regular host at, here at Ehanakako. So I want to I wanted to just get into the uh, the question, the title question, if you will, Kali'i. Proud to be Hawaiian and American. You know, over the past years uh, since since uh, the Constitutional Convention of 1978. A lot of people uh, don't like to be American. Uh, they, they make a choice. It's an either or, not both. Um, and, they, and they would rather dwell on sovereignty questions and, and rather um, you know, avoid, um, I mean literally, avoid and undo if they could, um, you know, the statehood and the territorialization of Hawaii back when. Um, you're not in that camp. So you're proud to be both Hawaiian and American. Could you explain your view of the matter and you know what you believe the correct course is? Well, thank you, Jay. Actually, I, I am very proud to be Hawaiian and American, and I think it's a great privilege. There is such richness that comes from my Hawaiian cultural background. As you know, as a child, I, I studied the chants and dances and was mentored by Winona Beamer, mother of Keolan Kapono, and uh, just learned so much about my culture. I went to Kamehameha schools. But I'm proud of my American heritage, uh, something we all share here. Uh, the values that have come from the United States of America put together with the values of being a Hawaiian are a dynamite combination. Uh, and there's so many ways in which they both complement each other and have created the, the, the basis for a, a real society that can make a difference in the world and that can be a thriving place for people to live and raise their families. Yeah, but, you know, in recent years, we've had a certain mm, decline of that kind of uh, kako. Um, and uh, in recent years, we've seen a polarization on these sure. issues. And uh, even in recent months, we've seen OHA take positions and, um, you know, get involved in initiatives that seem to create that, that kind of polarization. Uh, so let me ask you about some of them that have come up. Certainly. Y you mentioned the Akaka bill. So the Akaka bill, I think, is, is finished. It, it failed in Congress after a long effort. Uh, and now there's still a, uh, a, pretty, a pretty visible uh, initiative for sovereignty. What is the status of that initiative? Uh, is, what is OHA's role, you know, properly and factually in that initiative? And how do the Hawaiian people, at least the ones that you know, feel about it? Well, Jay, you're dealing with something that has changed over the years. You, you mentioned the Akaka Bill. And in many ways, the Akaka Bill, which was a congressional bill introduced by Senator Akaka uh, to give federal recognition of Hawaiians that would allow them to have a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. In many ways, people think of that as the, the key piece. But we really have to take a look at the way in which it has morphed. 
over the years. First of all, in the year 2000, we had the Akaka Bill. And yet, since that time, up through 2013, it has failed to be passed by the United States Congress. Uh, so it's no longer being offered. Uh, and it, the biggest problem with that, amongst the many arguments against it, is that it is not the case that Hawaiians are a tribe like Native American Indian tribes in a couple of ways. First of all, Hawaiians as a kingdom didn't base being part of the kingdom on race. From the time of King Kamehameha I all the way to Lili'uokalani, the last monarch, Chinese, Japanese, Caucasians, and others were part of the kingdom. And so Hawaiians weren't a homogenous group in that sense. The, the, the second thing uh, is that there has been no continuous government. So unlike the frontier days when the United States encountered existing nations such as the Indian tribes and gave them some space uh, uh, b because they were existing governments, we haven't had an existing continuous government. So these arguments led to the demise of the Akaka Bill. After the Akaka Bill, there was a second phase in, in which the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and proponents of the Akaka Bill tried to take the Akaka Bill language and put it into related or unrelated legislation. But it's been a cat and mouse game with opponents and uh, uh, proponents, uh, and that's pretty much come to an end. But there are two more morphs that are very relevant to today. Third, in order to seek this kind of state-sponsored sovereignty, the state of Hawaii in its legislature in session 2011 to 2012 adopted Act 195, which the governor signed into law, that said there shall be a Native Hawaiian Roll Commission. And that's a commission that will set up criterion for gathering the names of potential citizens of a Hawaiian nation. And at that that assumes that there's a Hawaiian nation in the offing. That's right, uh, but they will call it into being. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, the fourth morphing has been an attempt to seek executive action by President Obama. What Congress refused to do, what the Supreme Court shut down, President Obama is being asked to do with his signature, and that is to sign into law the existence of this Hawaiian sovereign nation and recognize it. Um, this is clearly unconstitutional and illegal, and he's been warned by at least four members of the United States Civil Service, I mean, excuse me, the United States Civil Rights Commission, that to do so would be illegal and unconstitutional. So those are the four forms of seeking sovereignty by the state that OHA has pursued. Let me just explain one thing and then hand it back to you, Jay. These are all about the state of Hawaii as government trying to create a sovereign nation through its agency, OHA. And the biggest problem with, with that is that the assets OHA manages are not its own to be given to a separate government. The assets actually belong to all the people of the state of Hawaii. So that, that's why it would be uh, not only unconstitutional, it would be theft <laughs> to, to, uh, for that to take place. This kind of sovereignty is not the kind of sovereignty being promoted by some activists who are outside of OHA. Uh, so that confuses people that we have these two kinds of sovereign, uh, sovereignty approaches. Gee, I, you know, I wasn't aware myself personally about this Native Hawaiian Roll Bill at the time it wended its way through the legislature, but what were the mechanics of that? I think a lot of people were not aware of it and certainly not aware of its implications as to allow for the creation of a, of a separate nation within our state. Absolutely. Uh, basically, Act 195 says that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs will oversee an agency called the Native Hawaiian Role. Many people have heard Kana'iolo Valu, the Hawaiian uh, term for, for that. And there shall be a commission. A commission shall be set up to identify people who have Hawaiian blood, who meet the criterion of being culturally connected as they define it and third, who swear an affidavit. They actually have to sign a legal affidavit in order to sign up. And that legal affidavit begins with the phrase, and I quote, I affirm the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Hawaiian people. So there are two problems with this right out the gate. Number one, it's creating a list of people who will have an election of delegates to a convention to determine its form of government. But 
It's a race-based election on American soil. Number two, it's a politically defined uh, uh, qualification. If you say, I don't affirm the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Hawaiian people, you can't be part of that. And that's where I stand. I, I affirm the sovereignty of the United States of America. And I'm glad as a Hawaiian to be part uh, of the United States of America. I cannot sign the oath that this native Hawaiian role requires. I cannot say I affirm the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Hawaiian people because A, there is no such thing. The Hawaiian people are not a sovereign government. And B, I'm proud to be an American. And so these are the criteria that were set up by our state legislature. Our governor signed it into law and it is clearly unconstitutional, but more than that, Jay, well, it's, I mean, it's when divisive. you say, yes. I, uh, uh, I agree with the unrelinquished affirm, sovereignty that's right. of, the, of the Hawaiian people, you, you are also saying that you never agreed uh, that the United States had uh, jurisdiction, had sovereignty in the first place. So, I mean, really, uh, it's more than unconstitutional. It's, uh, American citizens should not be making an affirmative oath to another sovereignty. Well, there are so many Americans who came to the United States through Ellis Island or came from Asia directly to Hawaii and so forth, who studied hard, who committed themselves to learn about what it is to be an American and who stood up in front of a judge at their naturalization ceremony and said, I renounce my allegiance to any other sovereignty. And so can you imagine what it is to take an oath in order to be part of this native Hawaiian role that says, I affirm the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Hawaiian people. Uh, it is extremely problematic. Uh, unfortunately, I think not a lot of legislators and uh, not a lot of people out in our general public have given much attention to this. Uh, you know, I went to a Rotary meeting last week and they began, of course, with the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. Which I hadn't recited in some time, but, you know, we all recited in school. And it begins with, I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. That is uh, an allegiance to the sovereignty of the United States. So I, I don't understand how the legislature, the legislature could forget that uh, and allow this to happen right within its midst, midst. And frankly, I don't understand how the governor of the state of Hawaii could have signed a bill like that into law. Well, you raise an important point. In fact, Jay, you were talking with me a little bit earlier about some recent happenings in the news in terms of what exactly the staff at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs believes, beginning with their chief executive officer. And it, apparently, from the recent news, they've taken this idea of unrelinquished sovereignty very seriously. Well, let's, uh, let's take a break. We'll come back and uh, discuss that in greater detail because I think that is, that is very important news. It's very important for uh, us to understand what happened, what motivated him to do that, um, and, and how, what kind of light or shadow it, it sends across OHA, especially now in view of your candidacy. Uh, that's Kali'i Akina, Grassroot Institute CEO. We're here on Ehanakako. Let's work together, all of us. I get that right? Um, talking about community matters and talking about being proud to be both Hawaiian and American. I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech Talks, talking about community matters, talking about a Hanukkah call working together with Kali'i Aquino, who is customarily the host of this show. He's the CEO of Grassroots Institute. We're talking about proud to be Hawaiian and American. We're talking about Kali'i's views of these things and some of the events around uh, OHA that have taken place. He's uh, running for trustee of OHA, so that makes it uh, particularly interesting. 
Um, so you were, you were speaking about the CEO uh, or the executive director of OHA recently wrote a letter, I think you were talking about that, to John Kerry, the Secretary of State of the United States. Now that was a very interesting and maybe disturbing letter. Can you, can you bring us current on that, Khalid? It was a very disturbing letter which, ha which was sent to the Secretary of State of the United States, oh, at the beginning of May, just a few days ago as we're recording this. And basically, not the trustee board, but the man that they have hired to be the CEO, the president of, or the, the CEO of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, also a government official, decided to write a letter to the Secretary of State to ask him what the legal stat status of Hawaii is. And in the letter he says this, that because there has been such a long illegal occupation of Hawaii by the United States, it, the legal status of Hawaii as a sovereign state is in question. And so he cannot get legal advice, he says in the letter, from the state attorney general. And the reason is that the state attorney general, he says, would be in a conflict of interest if it is true that Hawaii is not a legitimate sovereign state. So he asks the Secretary of State because, as he points out in the letter, the Secretary of State handles matters of relationship with foreign entities. Now, understand what's taking place. A government official in a United States of America and Hawaiian government organization is not sure whether the authority of the law of the state of Hawaii are valid and whether the state of Hawaii is a valid sovereign entity. And so he is appealing to the Secretary of State. Now, as a result, much embarrassment came upon the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and within a few days, its entire board of trustees rescinded the letter in their own letter to uh, Secretary Kerry. Uh, since then, interesting things have happened. One of the trustees has now revoked his rescinding uh, of the letter, and uh, there seems to be a lot of turmoil going on uh, at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. The trustees have not spoken out as to whether or not the CEO still has a job and so forth. Well, obviously, he still has a job. But the, the thing is this. Jay, I'm concerned because regardless of the propriety of the actions of the CEO, we have to ask, why in the world does he believe what he believes? Um, I don't think the trustees can get off scot-free. I think the people of Hawaii have to hold the trustees of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs responsible for creating the rhetoric, for creating the climate, and, and having a course of action that naturally causes their own staff to take them seriously, naturally causes their own staff to think that the trustees are all about setting up a separate sovereign nation. Uh, that's the only way I can explain it. Well, do you think, I mean, inherent in this is the question is whether he acted right or wrong, whether he acted with the authority of the trustees. I mean, is, is there some suggestion that he'd been off by himself and concocted this letter without consulting them? Well, as of today, and this story will unfold by the time uh, you're, the, all viewers get to see this program, but as of today, May 12th, the CEO of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs held his own news conference on the premises of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And in that news conference, he said that there had been a misunderstanding, that he had told the chairman of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, that he was going to write this letter and that she had perhaps forgotten that that had taken place, but that uh, the trustees and he have agreed to smooth things over through a process called ho'oponopono, which is to make things right. So that's the official position that he's taken today as to what's going on. Um, interestingly, the room full of uh, uh, news reporters was also filled largely with friends of the CEO, many of whom are Hawaiian activists. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for OHA. It's embarrassing for the state of Hawaii that the Secretary, the Secretary of State of the United States should receive a letter that, uh, that, that speaks of something that was finished 120, 30 years ago. Uh, this reminds me of perfect title, if you recall what happened in that Case. Certainly. When people, you know, uh, activists decided that the entire imprimatur of American law didn't apply 
and uh, they could give title reports um, based on an assumption that uh, there was no state of Hawaii and there was no sure. United States and it, we were all back before the takeover. I, I think that this helps the public understand that what OHA is doing is not merely an innocent little game off in a corner. I think for many of us, whether we're Hawaiian in blood or non-Hawaiian, uh, we don't usually vote in the OHA trustee elections. We don't usually pay a lot of attention. We certainly don't run for Office of Hawaiian Affairs, thinking that they're irrelevant to who we are. But when we look at their growing land holdings, when we look at their asset base, when we look, like, look at the fact that they're a major player in some of the key developments in Hawaii, whether it be with energy and geothermal or whether it be in downtown Honolulu at Kaka'ako, we better be concerned that they are a government agency and acting in a very autonomous way. Uh, and and this, is a, this is very problematic because for a government agency not to be sure whether or not the state of Hawaii is a legitimate state, you've got some really very big problems uh, brewing. And one of them is this. Uh, you remember the old Bishop Estate before they were reformed during the Broken Trust era? They had land, they had power, but they didn't have something else. Bishop Estate didn't have exemption from state development laws. OHA has land, it has power, it has now quickly become the 13th largest landholder. They are becoming a major broker and developer. So like Bishop Estate, they have land and they have power and they are trying to obtain something Bishop Estate could never get. And that is sovereignty and it's not to hold, have a reservation, it's not really to give greater benefits to the Hawaiian people, it's so that they can claim that their land is sovereign land and they can do two things. They can be exempt from Hawaii state development regulations because it's their sovereign land. And they could theoretically do what they want to do, which could be to operate institutions that Native American uh, tribes operate, such as casinos. Now, the, the point is this, and I'm not here to talk about the merits or demerits of casinos. The point is, we have to pay attention to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, it, uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is everybody's business. It's going to affect everybody's pocketbook. It's going to affect our, our freedoms here as developers, as businesses, as citizens. And if we don't pay attention, it can become everyone's problem. Uh, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the fact that anyone could be a trustee. Anyone could yes, run for that's trustee. Right. And I recall during uh, the uh, Caetano years, yes. there was a lawsuit. That's right. Uh, I guess it was a federal lawsuit where the court determined that anyone, indeed, anyone of any That's race right. could, in, in, in the electorate, in the electorate of Hawaii, uh, could, could run for trustee. And I guess that's the law today. How has that worked out, though? Are there any, are there, are there many uh, non-Hawaiian trustees in OHA? Well, you're talking uh, about the election for OHA trustees. Yes. And, and let me go back just a little bit before that. Originally in the 1978 um, Constitutional Convention for the State of Hawaii where OHA was brought into existence, th there was a movement even back then to take a grab at the ceded lands and to become a separate sovereign nation. And so emerging from that Constitutional Convention was an OHA in which only Hawaiians by blood could vote for trustees and only candidates with Hawaiian blood could run for trustee. Now the first feature, a race-based election, was struck down in the Supreme Court case Rice v. Cayetano as clearly unconstitutional that in America when we're having a public, a public officials elected who will manage public resources, you can't say people of some race can participate and not another. But you've just referred to who's qualified to run. And that the race qualification to run was also struck down. An attorney, Bill Burgess, filed a case, I think it was Arakaki, I can't remember the name exactly, versus Cayetano. And so that's what you're referring to, in which district court struck down the racial requirement to run for OHA. Since then, there has been one trustee without Hawaiian blood, but for the most part, all of the other trustees have had Hawaiian blood. Um, I would love to see the day in which caring people who have Hawaiian hearts, like Jay Fidel, based upon your ability to do fiduciary management, 
your ability to see that assets go to their proper end and so forth, based on that could be elected easily because we would be looking for competence rather than a racial requirement. Because Jay, I think you can care for all people as well as anyone else uh, and, and I think that's important. Uh, of course, however, we're not at that point uh, and it would probably be very difficult for someone without Hawaiian blood to run and win at this stage. Racial discrimination, which is what this is, seems so inappropriate in Hawaii, which is such a melting pot of so many races. It, it doesn't seem fair for the law to give any race an, an advantage That's over right. the other races. Now, and I do think that we can take care of the needs of Native Hawaiians in a very legitimate way but do so without creating institutions that discriminate or state-sponsored institutions. I think that's very important. There's a lot of aloha out there for needy Hawaiians, whether they're homeless, wh whether they're children, and so forth. But there are also needy uh, people of all races as well. And, and there is a solution to meet their needs without dividing people by race. And I think that's the kind of vision OHA needs to have. Let's take one last break, Kali'i, and then I'd like to come back and talk to you about what's going on in Kaka'ako Makai, which has also been in the newspapers pretty steadily over the past couple weeks. That's Kali'i Akina. He's the CEO of Grassroot Institute. We're here on Ehanakako, where he is normally the host himself, but today on the discussion of proud to be Hawaiian and American. I, I'll be the host. I'm Jay Fidel. Let's take a short break and come back and tackle Kaka'ako. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Please okay, it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. We'll see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Ehanakako with Kali'i Akina. Uh, so one of the things that came up in the break, uh, Kali'i, is what, what happens to Mr. Crabb now, the uh, CEO of uh, OHA, given the embarrassing and the embarrassment around that letter to uh, John Kerry, the Se Secretary of State? What's going to happen with that? Well, obviously there's a tremendous amount of internal politics taking place. This is clearly a power play. Uh, exactly what the aims are and who the powers are is not very clear. But I'll tell you this, uh, for the, Hawaii, the people of Hawaii, for all of us, what happens internally in OHA is not the big issue. The issue is this, uh, regardless of the propriety of the CEO to, to raise questions about whether Hawaii is truly a state or is an, under illegal U.S. occupation, the propriety of that really uh, is something we have to hold the trustees of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs for, uh, responsible for, because it's the trustees who have set their course on a sovereign nation sponsored by OHA. It's the trustees who have required anyone who signs up for this sovereign nation to sign an affidavit saying that they affirm the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Hawaiian people. So if they've created a Kool-Aid, then their CEO and their staff have merely drunk the Kool-Aid. Uh, and I think that we have to hold them responsible. And that's what the elections are for. You see, the trustees are not held accountable on an ongoing basis to the legislature nor to the governor. They are held accountable at every election to the people of Hawaii. And that's one reason why the people of Hawaii need to get out there, everyone, regardless of race, and vote for good OHA trustees. Good that you're running. So anyway, so uh, the other thing is, um, uh, again, accountability is the uh, OHA made a deal with the state of Hawaii, with the executive, with Governor Neil Abercrombie to take some $180 million worth of land in Kaka'ako Makai. No sooner than the ink dried on that, 
was uh, the OHA was trying to, and the governor was willing to do it, to advance um, their position, OHA's position, to try to get that land to be much more valuable than at the time they took it in the deal. It was like bettering their own deal. Um, and, and they went to, to the legislature this year and tried to get a rezone to change what Calvin Say had done back in 2005 uh, to make it unbuildable. Now, apparently, um, that bill failed. That is the bill to make a condo out of it. A absolutely right. You see, in this past legislative session, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has shown its hand. Uh, most people think of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs as a social service agency to care for the needs of Hawaiians. In reality, the model we should think of is the old Bishop Estate, a massive and growing land trust that has land and power, but they're seeking developmental exemptions in order to be more powerful. And the major piece of their legislature this past session was to double the value of their property right at the doorstep of Honolulu in Kaka'ako by getting an exemption to the 200-foot building limit and being able to build residential towers of 400 feet. Well, that failed. But you know what is interesting? The other pieces of their legislative package that also failed. Uh, they wanted to have uh, two members uh, who were sensitive to Hawaiian needs uh, on the Board of Land and Natural Resources. They wanted every single officer of a, an agency in the state that dealt with land to go through their approved course in native Hawaiian land. Uh, they wanted the right to audit at will the books of any state agency if they suspected that they were hiding money from the ceded land. And fourth, they wanted to be able to exempt themselves from the state ethics laws so that their trustee meetings in which they conducted their business would exclude the media and the public. And what we see here is OHA tipping its hand so that we have to understand this is not a benign social service agency. This is an organization on a path to become a big player if it gets its way in development in Hawaii. They'll have land, they'll have power, and they'll have a certain kind of exemption from development rules, especially if they get their sovereignty that they're trying to get. Why did it fail? I, I don't know why. I think sometimes our legislators have wisdom. <laughs> but I actually, I, I think there are two reasons uh, not to be facetious. Well, one reason is I think that their package was too audacious. And in light of their public relations problems and so forth, it was too much to grab for at once. But there's a second issue here, and this has to go to the management of OHA. OHA has lost track of the fact that it's a trust. Trusts maintain assets in trust for the beneficiaries, and there must be a supreme duty to protect those assets. Instead, OHA was behaving like a rising developer, and so it went for the brass ring. And it was willing to settle for what it now claims was an undervaluation of the property they took in settlement two years ago. They claim that they were cheated, but they weren't cheated. They knew what they were doing. They claimed that it was undervalued. They went ahead and received an undervalued amount of property, which wasn't a proper action for a trust. And then they tried to leverage that property in a big scheme to build skyscrapers, not skyscrapers, high-rise um, residential developments, and they showed that they didn't have the political clout, they didn't have the capacity to lobby, they didn't have the ability to make their case, and so they failed. So this is an important thing. I don't think it's permanent because they're a smart organization. They're going to regroup. But the point is they've shown their hand, and part of showing their hand is that they're behaving in a way that's not appropriate for a trust. They're behaving like a business that's shooting for the big deal, and they've failed so far, but they'll be back at it. Yeah, well, I think when Act 195 that you referred to earlier uh, passed, um, I don't think the legislature, they, I don't think they had shown their hand to the same degree, and people, including the legislature, were not uh, fully aware of the implications of that act, as we discussed. But <clears throat> now, after this package, and after the attempt to enhance the value of that land pursuant to some deal that had been made, um, now they have shown their hand, and presumably the legislature is going to be more Akamai 
about exactly where they stand. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that it's important to understand that this whole business about sovereignty isn't really about starting a reservation. It isn't really about segregating Hawaiians off and making a separate culture. In fact, on this show, we've had two sitting trustees, and one of them actually said here, you know, Kaylee, most of us Hawaiians are mostly something else. Now, we are so, as Hawaiians, integrated with the rest of, of the culture, our lives, our jobs, our families, our children, that OHA is really not representing the Hawaiian people by saying we're going to create this separate sovereignty, sovereignty. So what we have to be smart about, what voters in Hawaii have to realize, is that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is a developer. It is a landowner and a developer, and it is seeking this sovereignty in order to be able to have exemption from state development laws on its property. That will make them so very powerful and so very profitable here in the state of Hawaii. And that is not what was intended in 1978 or any time since, in my view. Anyway, uh, just to, to close by saying that we're going to have a further discussion of the, of the whole issue about uh, land development by OHA uh, in, uh, in Kaka'ako Makai at our Kaka'ako program, which is called Finally Finding Our Future in Kaka'ako. And it is uh, scheduled to take place on May 21st, a Wednesday next week from this show, uh, at Fuller Hall in the Laniakea uh, Women's YWCA downtown here. Kali'i Akina is one of the speakers, and so is Oz Stender. And we will be very interested to hear what they have to say about that aspect of the development of Kaka'ako. Thank you so much, Kali'i. Well, thank you, Jay. And I appreciate the opportunity to say we must work together, Ehana Kako, for the unity of Hawaiians by blood and Hawaiians at heart. Aloha, you true Hawaiian. <laughs> thank you for that. Stay tuned for Rafi Boritza. He was going to talk about uh, medicine in Cuba. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.